Good afternoon. I'm Casey Swales, and welcome to the 2022 NASA Safety Standdown, Safety in a New Era of Space Exploration. As in years past, today we observe our annual day of remembrance by taking time out to reflect on the lives of heroes tragically lost in the pursuit of discovery and exploration, including the crews of Apollo 1 and Space Shuttle's Challenger in Columbia. As said by Administrator Nelson and Deputy Administrator Melroy in messages this week, it's also a time for us to reflect on the lessons learned from these tragedies and to remind ourselves of the critical responsibility each of us has in caring and safely executing the mission. As we prepare to return humans to the moon and onto Mars, we must continue to embrace our core value of safety as both an institutional and an individual responsibility. And our core value of inclusion reminds us to ensure that every voice is heard and every NASA member family feels comfortable speaking up. Our discussion will cover many insightful and possibly some difficult topics from experts. But more importantly, these leaders have firsthand professional and personal experience. And I can't think of anyone better than this group to discuss today's topic. While they need no introduction, Administrator Bill Nelson, Deputy Administrator Pam Melroy, Associate Administrator Bob Cabana, all former NASA astronauts, and Russ Deloche, NASA's Chief of Safety and Mission Assurance. Thank you all for joining us for this important discussion. And now I turn it over to Administrator Nelson. Thank you, Casey. This is a solemn day of remembrance and we wanted to share with you what uh, we have just done. We've returned from Arlington Cemetery where Pam and Bob and I participated first in the changing the guard. After the changing, then we had a wreath that the three of us went up to the tomb of the unknown and uh, presented that wreath. And you're seeing uh, uh, a picture now of a wreath that then we placed at the markers for Columbia and for Challenger. Uh, there are several of the astronauts that are buried in, in the immediate vicinity of those markers. Uh, each of us spoke uh, briefly. Uh, we were joined by friends of one of the crew from Columbia, and uh, we had uh, them speak as well. General Charlie Bolden uh, joined us in the audience, former administrator and former administrator Sean O'Keefe as well uh, joined us. And then uh, we walked over to another part of the cemetery where there is the new Apollo 1 marker, and two of the astronauts of the three are buried there, uh, Grissom and Chafee. And we had another uh, moment of reflection and remembrance. As we're walking back uh, to get into our vehicles, I remembered that John Glenn is buried not far. And so a few steps off of the roadway, uh, the three of us went over to pay tribute to John Glenn. It's interesting on his tombstone, he says U.S. Marine Corps, then he says fighter pilot, he says, astronaut, and senator. I think of all those, uh, the Marine Corps is probably the most important. It's a solemn day, it's a sad day, but it is a day for us to remember not only these wonderful people and to remember them as the vibrant people that they were, but also for us to remember the lessons 
that we should learn from those accidents because mistakes, human mistakes, cause those accidents. And since we live in such a high risk, high charged environment where so many things are just right on the line. And, and this agency is, I keep saying, it, it, it proves that the impossible becomes possible, but it's not without risk. And that's what we want to minimize. And so the three of us want to share with you some of the experiences that we've had over the course of remembering back about these three crews. I was on Hoot Gibson's crew, which was the 24th flight of the space shuttle. We uh, still have the record, uh, not enviable, of the most delays and the most scrubs, four. But the reason I mention that, we were supposed to go in December of 1985. We didn't get off the ground until the 12th of January landing on the 18th. And of course, you remember what happened on the 28th, 10 days later. There are lessons learned when the Rogers Commission named after Secretary of State Rogers, went in and did the examination, and they, in fact, uh, had such luminaries as Neil Armstrong on that commission. Uh, what they concluded that a number of mistakes had been made. They pointed, for example, to the second scrub that we had on the flight back a scrub in early January in which someone had overridden the computer and started to drain out 18,000 pounds of liquid oxygen. And an alert supervisor caught it that the LOX line was too uh, cold and stopped the count at T minus 31. The Rogers Commission noted that because they thought that fatigue had played a part. And so going forward, let's keep that in mind, not to be so fatigued that at critical moments of decision making that we're not at our best. But then look what happened to Challenger. They got down to the night before, the weather has now gone down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. There are icicles hanging on the launch tower. And Jim begs, and you're seeing the crew coming out. And uh, they don't have on their top coats because they went from crew quarters there right into that crew van. But it was 25 degrees the night before. At this point, it's probably about 29 degrees. By the time that they finally launched, it was 36 degrees. But what did that do? The rubberized gaskets in the field joints of the solid rocket boosters called O-rings that cold weather the night before had stiffened them. And so as Challenger launched and those hot gases expanded out the field joint and hit right into the external tank. And at about nine or 10 miles high, the external tank blew. There are lessons learned from that because the night before back in Utah, 
the engineers of Morton Thiokol, they were telling their management, stop the count. It's the O-rings. It's cold. Later on in another investigation, I talked to one of the engineers in that investigation. And I said, how were you alerted to know that it was potentially a problem on earrings other than your engineering expertise? And he said, it was when we got back your Columbia, the 24th flights, O-rings, in the solid rocket boosters, we saw that there was blow-by, and you actually launched in a relatively warm 54 degrees, and there were still blow-by. And we said, that's interesting. That happened a previous year. And what was the month? It was January. What's common to January? And thus they were alerted. But the management didn't listen. And it went all the way up the chain of command. It went up uh, to people at the very top. I'm going to tell you one more thing that's quite unique about this flight. Jim Beggs, the administrator of NASA, just a week before, had been indicted by a federal grand jury for something that he did not commit. And he was sure that he could clear his name quickly by getting the evidence out of the Department of Defense. By the way, it took him two years to do that. And then the prosecution dropped the case. But not on that day of January 28th. Jim Beggs, now no longer administrator, is still in his office back at headquarters. And he's looking at the NASA TV and he's seeing the icicles. And he's calling the Cape and saying, stop the count. And they wouldn't take his call because he wasn't the administrator. One thing after another, very prominent people in NASA's history back in the Apollo program were asked about their opinion. And no one gave a clear answer. There's always risk, but there's always safety. You have to balance that risk and the safety. And for an experience that is so personal to me, we had trained with the Challenger crew since we were so late getting off the ground after four scrubs. They were actually at the Cape doing their practice countdown. They stayed with us in crew quarters when we were in quarantine. There's always risk. You have to balance that risk with safety. And so this day of remembrance, I hope for all of our wonderful folks in NASA will be another day of reflection, not only on these great people, but also on the watchword of safety. Bob, tell us about some of your experiences. So I'll try and be a little brief because I want to leave time for discussion, but I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Columbia crew. And uh, there's a picture I'd like you to put up. They've got it on there. And I, I want to personalize these people for you. When we talk about these crews, uh, a lot of folks are new to NASA, but these are moms and dads, sons and daughters. They're, they're our friends. And, uh, you know, it's really important that we know who it is we're putting on these vehicles and that we make sure that we are making the right decisions when we do it. If I could get that picture up, because I want to talk a little bit about each crew member and I want to show you something. 
Obviously, that's not that crew. <laughs> hey, much younger Bob Cabana. It is a nice picture of Bob. <laughs> but th this is the uh, this is the Columbia crew, STS-107, and uh, this was my first flight as the director of uh, flight crew operations. I think the hardest job I've ever had is being a, a family escort when I was an astronaut, standing on the roof of the launch control center with uh, holding a two-year-old next to one of your best friend's wives watching five to seven of your close friends go off in that ball of flame, it, it's a challenge. But if you look at Rick Husband there on the, on the lower left, Rick was one of the finest Christian men I've ever known. Just a, a really competent Air Force test pilot and a really nice man. Behind him, you got, uh, you know, Dave Brown. Dave Brown was not only a naval aviator, he was a flight surgeon in the Navy. And uh, I used to, whenever I needed a new TV or a stereo system, I went to Dave because he was the expert on all that stuff. Next, next to Dave is Laurel Clark. Laurel Clark was a flight surgeon in the Navy and probably one of the most positive people I've ever met. She always had a smile. She knew when you were down and she'd cheer you up and pick you up. Kulpna. Kulpna was uh, an amazing uh, scientist, engineer, uh, hardworking, and just, just a great personality, great person. Uh, behind Kulpna there, Mike Brown, Air Force test pilot. Uh, loved his Audi TT. Just one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. Uh, in front of him, Willie McCool. Willie was uh, second in his class at the Naval Academy. And uh, one of the most uh, competent test pilots I've ever known. But you'd never know it talking to him. He was just a mild-mannered nice guy. And, and on the far right there on the end, Alain Ramon, uh, the first Israeli to fly in space, uh, just a, another super nice guy. And then you look down there on the lower left in that picture, and you see Columbia laid out in pieces as they started to accumulate back at the Cape after one of the largest recovery efforts ever. And the reason I put this up here is I want folks to see the consequences of the decisions that we make. And I will tell you right now, everybody that made decisions related to any of these accidents did not make that decision thinking that they were causing, that it would result in causing harm to anyone. All right? But our decisions have consequences. And that's why it is so important that we have all the knowledge that we can possibly have when we make our decisions that their decisions are based on the best data possible. And the only way we can do that is if everybody has a voice. We have to create an environment where everyone participates. And you can take the picture down now and we'll just talk. But I think it's really important that when you are running a meeting, everybody has to have a voice at the table. Everybody needs to be listened to, not heard, but listened to, all right? And that's the way we get the best data to make informed decisions. So it's up to us as leaders to ensure that we're encouraging that discussion, that everybody has a voice, that we have a diverse team so that we get the best data to make an informed decision. So I don't ever want to have to go through a, another Columbia. And if you look at, you know, from 67, to 86 was 19 years. From 86 to 2003 was 17 years. From 2003 till now, it's 19 years. All right? We're in that same time frame. Well, why is that? Well, we've had a huge turnover in our personnel. We have new people. We have different people in leadership positions. I don't want to forget the lessons learned from the past, okay? And we're in a time of great change right now. We're building new spacecraft. I don't want to see us complacent with the commercial crew vehicles that we're flying. We have to pay attention all the time. Every year, this time, I dig out my copy of the Columbia Report, and it's kind of falling apart. I've got it clipped together in the middle. But I've, I've got all the key sections highlighted, and, and I've got notes that I've taken, and I refresh myself. I want to make sure that we are doing the right thing. Pam? Thank you, Bob. I, I'd like to talk about some of the aspects of culture uh, that I've observed and really appreciated and learned from. Um, 
I want to talk about my uh, first job in the astronaut office after I graduated. I was a Cape Crusader, and a Cape Crusader is someone who helps prepare the shuttle cockpit for the crew, helps strap them in as a part of the closeout crew, uh, and in fact, uh, as a part of that closeout crew, you're also responsible for rescuing the crew if they become incapacitated inside the shuttle. And uh, I was uh, standing up at the 195 foot uh, level, and uh, my good friends who called themselves pad rats, they made me an honorary pad rat eventually and gave me a hat to prove it, uh, were talking to me about crew's uh, rescue. And uh, they pointed out uh, a locker uh, right at the end of the, the, the um, area where the crew walks out to the vehicle, and it's right there, and uh, leaned down and pulled up uh, the, the locker door and told the story that for Apollo 1, uh, when the fire occurred, I think people have, are familiar with the story of the fact that uh, because the hatch opened, um, um, it hope opened inward, there was so much pressure, they couldn't, they couldn't get into the vehicle after the fire. Uh, the truth is the crew would not have survived, I think, you know, maybe if they had been able to open the, the, uh, the hatch. Uh, it all happened very fast. But uh, one of the stories that's probably less well known is that in their hurry to try to get inside that hatch, they went to the safety locker where all the safety equipment was stowed, pry bars and things like that, and it was locked. And nobody at the pad knew where the key was or how to get in it. And so um, almost 30 years later, this was 1996, they remembered that story and they said, this locker is never locked. It's always open for you know, any kind of an emergency. And I just really took that on board and went, wow. I mean, they remember and they know why. You know, as test pilots, we, we have a saying, there's a lot of procedures written in blood. It's things that we've learned because we've learned the hard way. And, uh, and it really resonated with me. And so uh, shortly after that, when I was out at the Cape, I was out at KSC giving a silver Snoopy, uh, and a manager of the person who I gave the Snoopy to said, have you been out to pad 34? And I said, no, no, but I'm, you know, I've heard this story from the, uh, the rescue folks. And so he took me out there and uh, I was reflecting on it today when we were at Arlington because it feels like hallowed ground to me. And that's, I had that same feeling at Arlington. And, uh, and I just felt this really profound connection uh, out at that pad and always used to after every launch where I worked as a Cape Crusader, I would go out to pad 34 and let the guys know we'd had a good launch and the crew was safely in space. So that, that really stuck with me. But I think um, as I reflect on the things that we've learned, for example, for Challenger, um, the having a suit would not have saved the crew from that mishap. But we had a culture to say, what are all the things that we can do to help protect the crew better? And so uh, after that, astronauts wore pressure suits. And we trained for uh, evacuation wearing those suits. There were hundreds of steps that were taken on the space shuttle, not directly part of the cause of the Challenger mishap, but things that we knew would make the crew safer and make the situation more survivable. And uh, something near and dear to my heart, uh, Bob showed a picture of the reconstruction of Columbia. Well, as a result of that reconstruction where we had pieces of the vehicle that we could go back and do an analysis, we did the first ever crew survival investigation. Previously, it, it really was very focused on the cause of the mishap. But this was a dedicated survival investigation to say, what, how did everything work? How did their uh, procedures work, their training, and very importantly, their equipment? Not directly related to the cause of the mishap, but making things safer. And what was really important 
is that we, NASA, sent a copy to every company, at first every country engaged in human spaceflight, but also, if you think back 2008, that was sort of the beginning of a lot of commercial activities, right? There were a lot of companies just starting to talk about commercial human spaceflight. Anyone who ever talked about it, we sent them a copy. And I think, you know, as I, I reflect on, you know, what does that culture mean to me? I think uh, it's that we uh, learn everything we can to make uh, the, the deaths involved most meaningful, not just how to fix the one thing or five things that, that, that were involved in the mishap, but to really have a culture of saying, let's, let's look at everything that could affect the safety of the crew and let's think about it. Even if nothing's happened yet in that area, how we can make things better. And that's a culture we need to share uh, out with the rest of the world and our commercial partners at a pivotal moment like this. We remember and we rise. That's our culture. And we never forget. Uh, you know, NASA's on a roll right now. You look back the past year, Perseverance, DART, XP, uh, James Webb. Uh, look at the commercial crew to the station, commercial cargo. All of it's going so well. But as Bob says, it's been 19 years. And uh, we, we've got to constantly be on our toes. Bob, as we're getting ready for Artemis One, what are some of the things that come to mind? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, well, one of the things is that, you know, we can't get launch fever. We got to pay attention. Folks, we got to process. We got to work through it methodically. We got to make sure that uh, we uh, cross all the T's, dot all the I's. I, I think one of the big challenges is going to be getting all the, uh, the, the paperwork closed out and uh, making sure that we've documented everything correctly, that we haven't missed something. Uh, of course, Artemis I is a, a, a test flight without crew, but we intend to put crew on this vehicle. We are, we are certifying this to fly with crew on its second flight. So we gotta make sure that we do it correctly. And I, I think the, the key thing is, um, you know, we can't get launch fever. I know we wanna get it going, but we also gotta make sure that we're, we're taking our time and, and doing it right. Russia, you know, what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, I, I, I'm not a former astronaut, so I have to have notes. <laughs> but I do have a few that I wanted to share about risk. And I, I'd like to start, actually, with a quote from Charlie Bolden. He um, said, when you do stuff that nobody else has ever done, you have to be willing to accept risk. We have to be willing to do daring things. Put another way, risk intolerance is a guarantee of failure to accomplish anything of significance. And you know, at the beginning of a program, establishing that risk posture up front is, is very critical. And that establishes how much risk are you willing to take in each domain, your know, cost, schedule, performance, safety. And that risk posture has to consider, you know, what's the benefit of taking that risk? What are we gaining by taking that risk? What makes the risk worth it? Um, NPD 1000, if you've read our governance handbook, it talks about that and talks about a concept called risk leadership. But human spaceflight is not inherently safe. So the hard questions that we must answer are, how safe is safe enough? And how will we know when we're there? You know, I've been doing this job for 35 years, and those questions don't seem to get any easier but they're very important to address up front so that everybody understands where the line is. And then once you're in program execution, we need everyone engaged in identifying and communicating risk so decision makers can understand when that line has been crossed. Taking risks smartly versus being reckless. I think that's what we owe to our crews and their families. You know, so today, we pause to reflect on our past and the lessons, the hard lessons we have learned. 
and committing ourselves to not repeating mistakes. We may make new mistakes as our mission to explore and discover takes us to new places, new challenges, new environments. But to honor those we have lost, we must not let the lessons of Apollo 1, Challenger, and Columbia show up in another investigation report. Mm -hmm. To end with a, another Charlie quote, we must constantly balance our risks and rewards and always, always put the lives and safety of our people first. And, and Russ, I want to give you and your team uh, a compliment. Uh, you, you don't say no, you look for that yes, if answer, and it's understanding what we can do to mitigate the risk as we move forward. You know, um, we are in a very risky business. And a lot of folks, as we transition to the commercial model in some places, if you look back, you know, hindsight's always 20-20. It's, it's easy. You ask me what I'm thinking about, what worries me, and I, I worry about all the decisions that we make. Are we making the right decisions now? If something happens down the road, is it going to be a decision that we made that could have impacted that one way or another? Because, you know, after the fact, you can look back and say, oh, man, that, that wasn't a good decision. So I think, again, it gets back to making sure that we have all the data to make the best informed decisions. So. It, that, that's always a concern, but when I look at the different models that we have now, if you look at uh, both Challenger and Columbia, those were, you know, cost plus contracts with NASA deep involvement in each one of those. And, and just because you have that model that, that we had then, that doesn't mean that it's safe. Safety isn't by the model that you have, safety is how you operate. You can have other models and you need to ensure that the safety is embedded in it. I'd like to bring up a point, too. I think, you know, as we're talking about the years that have gone by between the mishaps, I was out with you at the SLF on the day that the Columbia crew did not come home. And I was, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, I'd flown in space, but I, I was not as experienced as you. You had lived through Challenger. No one uh, out there had been at NASA for Challenger. And uh, I don't know how we could have, I mean, the shuttle <laughs> is a hypersonic vehicle. It's gonna land, you know, plus or minus a second or so. It, it's not gonna be a few minutes late like an airplane. But we stood there and those of us who had not lived through Challenger were sort of in a state of, well, maybe it, what can we, and you knew before everybody else because you had lived through Challenger. You, you knew that it could happen, and so you came to believe it first. So I think this aspect of just really taking on board the fact that it really could happen to us is, is a really important part of that, that viewpoint. Just knowing that it could happen and believing it is and, important. And that's why having a contingency plan is so important. Yeah. You know, you plan for the worst mm -hmm. and, and hope you never have to uh, execute it. But even, even if you have a contingency plan, it will never go as yeah. expected or as you planned. And that's why so, leadership is so important, having uh, good leaders that are able to act when things don't necessarily go as planned. One of the things we saw in, in Challenger and then unfortunately it seems like also in Columbia was the concept of normalization of deviance. Oh, I know. Um, any, any thoughts on that and how we prevent that from recurring? Well, again, when bad things happen, when something is anomalous or not going as it should but nothing bad happens, it's easy to get into a mode that it's okay. And, and that's why we have to pay such close attention when, when something isn't working exam, exactly right. You know, I, I would say we've seen a, a couple of uh, delayed parachute delays now on the uh, fourth shoot with uh, uh, cargo vehicles returning in, a, in one crew vehicle. And, and we need to make sure that we understand the model that we have, that we're okay as we go forward. That's gonna require a little, a little looking into and, and not just accepting that, well, it's okay, nothing bad happened. And of course, uh, since we have this model where we are now working with the commercial companies, uh, we want to 
assure you that uh, NASA is very much involved uh, with the commercial companies uh, to ensure this safety. But we don't want to ever get into the mindset, oh, well, the company is doing that as part of the commercial crew or in the case of the moon landing, the commercial uh, lander, let the company do that. NASA's got to stay all over it when it comes to the safety. Of our own people. Of our own people. And our exploration These program. Our people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it all comes down to. It comes down to uh, taking care of people, to leadership, to communication. I mean, I, I think communication has been the key in so much of this. And I, I, I want to make sure that everybody is being heard. And I, I think we do a pretty good job, but there's always room for improvement. And I don't want, after the fact, somebody to say, but I was raising this as an issue and nobody would listen to me. And of course, the examples we've given you to the day that we have had some personal experience in, all are around this idea that when you stop communicating, when you think you know it all and you're not listening to your people, that's when you get in trouble. So we hope that uh, this discussion, do you have anything more for us? I do, I do have a question for Pam. Um, yeah. you know, so Pam, as the, as the champion of diversity, equity, mm -hmm. inclusion, mm -hmm. and accessibility for NASA, mm -hmm. how do you see that um, those elements playing into the culture that we want to have that ensures safety going forward? Uh, DEIA is so central to our mission for a couple of different reasons, and each aspect has some angle or lens that we can look at how it impacts our mission and our safety, um, particularly as we are doing very difficult things. Um, I mean, we felt this way with a crew. Uh, it was really good to have diverse backgrounds. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that um, at the Intelsat rescue, uh, the guy on the crew who knew absolutely nothing about EVA, the rookie pilot, Kevin Chilton, one of the best astronauts we've ever had, but on his rookie flight, asked the question, well, why can't we send three astronauts out EVA at the same time? No one would have thought of that without somebody who had no preconceived ideas. So as we are, are doing the things that are challenging, we need to have a, a set of diverse perspectives for problem solving, for creativity, for new ideas, and seeing things. But I think inclusion in particular and, and accessibility gets to the, access, uh, to the point of all voices being heard. Absolutely. And, and to, to make sure that everyone feels safe uh, they are sure that they are a part of the NASA team, uh, part of the NASA family, and that they have the right to speak up and the right to be heard. So, the, the, you know, to me, it's foundational to both our mission success, but also our safety culture. And Russ, you know, um, you're now responsible or the owner of the uh, Apollo Challenger Columbia uh, learning, if you will. and. Uh, I would, I would hope that all of you, uh, when you get down to uh, Florida, if you have not had the opportunity, uh, go to uh, the Visitor Center and tour Forever Remembered at the Atlantis facility, which is a tribute to the uh, Challenger and Columbia crews. And it talks about each of the crew members. Uh, it talks about the, the accident, emotional and, and physical recovery of the debris. And, and it also talks about moving forward and uh, return to flight. And also out at the, um, at the Saturn V facility is a rough road leads to the stars that uh, honors the uh, Apollo 1 crew. And it talks about the, the design changes and uh, what was done to improve uh, spacecraft. And, you know, I mean, th there were a lot of changes on the Apollo vehicle after the, uh, the fire. There were over 100 changes to Challenger after the fire. We made multiple changes to, uh, to the tank in the process after uh, Columbia. I, I think it's really important. You know, yes, we had accidents, 
but we learned from them and rose above them and, and went on to do more. And I, I just would like to see us not have to relearn uh, some of this stuff. But what I wanted to get to is I think everybody that has a chance, um, we have the Columbia uh, remains stored in the Vehicle Assembly Building. And man, if I had my way, everybody that's a senior leader at NASA would see that firsthand. It goes back to that picture that I showed earlier the consequences of the decisions that we make. But we, we, do, we do hope that, that by this summer, um, things are so that we can restart that uh, safety leadership program and bring executives down to KSC and, and give them those tours. And you know, Bob, because you know, I was there with you, um, much credit to Bob for creating those exhibits at the visitor center, and they are impressive and they are moving. Um, it's hard to walk through them without tearing up, but um, thank you. But, but I, I really want to see that executive leadership program start. I was just going to we'll say, yeah, I, that's, that's really important. It's timely and yep. it's very important. And I will say, speaking of training, um, next week, I believe February 1st, we're rolling out to all civil service um, training plans in Saturn a new a new organizational silence a kind of familiarization course so that you can understand what are the factors that go into that. It, you know, it's, it's usually, as you, as you said earlier, Bob, it's, it's not that there are some person with, with ill intent running things. It's just that these, there's these dynamics that sort of, if you're not on guard, they, they happen and contribute to the wrong environment. And, and by the way, I thought that uh, Challenger uh, safety course that was in Saturn that we all had to take was excellent. Really you guys did a great job on that. You thank did. you. Well, we want to thank you for joining us today. We wanted to have a discussion on the Day of Remembrance as we look forward to this incredible future that we have. We are, by nature, in the NASA family, we are overcomers. And we have overcome these tragedies. And any tragedies in the future, we will overcome. But being an overcomer is also being someone that is concerned about the subjects that we've been talking about, safety. So we thank you for being a part of this discussion. We thank you for reflecting with us on this day of remembrance. We thank you for remembering these heroes and many more that we have not talked about. People that lost their lives in the NASA program that have not been memorialized here but in a training accident or something of where they were actually uh, contributing to NASA lost their life. So it's good to remember, but it's good to look forward. So thank you for joining us. And we're gonna put on the screen uh, a picture of the astronaut T-38s in flying in formation. And when one of the four pulls up, going heavenward in the missing man formation. God bless you. Thank you for your public service to our country and to NASA. <laughs>